This is Abe Freetanzer from Awards Watch, and I'm so thrilled to be speaking with Oscar winner Ben Proudfoot. How are you, Ben? I'm good. How are you, Abe? Good, good. So two years ago, you got a nomination for a concerto as a conversation. Last year, you won for the Queen of Basketball. And this year, you have two films that could get you nominated again, right? Well, yeah, we'll we'll see. But it's been it's been a great uh, a great series of years. And I've been lucky to have have found a platform for these all of these important stories. Well, it doesn't apply for a concerto, but otherwise you just have this long list of great unheralded women that you just like, oh, like, I need to find time to make a movie about them so the world knows about them. Well, I mean, wouldn't you feel the same way if you were you found out about this story? You'd be like, God, this is a great story that we got to make a movie, you know, um, you got to follow the tug. That's true. And I know you said you're not a big basketball guy. Is it fair to assume you're also not a big food guy or was Sally Schmidt a little more accessible that way? That's different. Yeah. So I love cooking. I've cooked my way through most of Sally's cookbook. Um, I love food. So that that was definitely an indulgence for me. Do you like her like her kind of food? Her oh, you know, yeah. California no, no. cooking? I mean, it's totally right up my alley. And frankly, Thomas Keller's too. I mean, it's very different. Um, but yeah, I love cooking. I spent a lot of time in the kitchen. I love food. Actually, since doing this film, I turned my lawn in my backyard into a little garden. I call it the Canadian laundry um, and try to make as much food as I can from from what I can grow in my little backyard. <laughs> oh, yeah, I love I love food. I love food and I love chefs and I love cookbooks. That's a real passion of mine. And like with the Queen of Basketball, you got a chance to talk to somebody and really get sort of like the last opportunity to really showcase someone right before they died, which is, I think, very bittersweet, right? Totally bittersweet. Um, yeah. And I mean, even harder in this case, because Sally passed away before we even finished the movie. Um, you know, with Lucy, she was there at the premiere. She got to see a lot of the, you know, excitement and groundswell of support around her. Um, you know, but Sally, uh, Sally's family said that she hated the spotlight. And so I think they were like, she knew what was going on and she was out of here. And, you know, so I think, um, although it would have been nice for me to see her and know whether she liked it or not, I think, uh, she probably, uh, you know, was happy to avoid the, all of the hubbub and excitement about her beautiful tale. And then, of course, with Mink, it's unusual. You do not have a living subject. Instead, you have, you know, her daughter, who's very informative. But what really got you interested in, in her? Yeah, well, that, you know, that story, I found out about it making Queen of Basketball because I was trying to find out about Title IX and where that came from. And all I knew about it was that Richard Nixon had signed it. Um, but it didn't seem like Richard Nixon had any idea what he was signing. And it didn't take long for me to get to Patsy Mink's story, who was, of course, the first congresswoman of color, which made a lot more sense of the person who would probably be in charge of a, you know, anti-discrimination bill. Um, and as I got further and further into her story, um, I came across the speech that Nancy Pelosi made when um, Patsy passed away about 20 years ago. And in this speech, she talked about this crazy, dramatic you know, frankly, like Hollywood movie type story where on the day of the crucial vote, her only daughter gets into a life-threatening car accident and she has to choose, it's like a Ron Howard movie. She has to choose between staying on the house floor and going and being by her daughter's bedside and the whole thing comes down to one vote. Uh, I just was like, this is crazy. You know, this is a crazy story. And obviously it would have been great if Patsy was uh, alive to tell her own story, but in this case, Wendy was, and I found that, you know, that was a way in to solve the problem of what, what do you do when you have an amazing story that needs to be told, but the person has passed away. So this was our uh, foray into solving that problem. What also struck me as different is the title, that it's, you know, other than the best chef in the world, the queen of basketball, you know, and this is just Mink. How did you settle yeah. on that? Well, I, I kind of saw it as an extension of her campaign. And a lot of her posters had, you know, her last name in big, bold letters. Um, and so we literally just, you know, scanned one of these beautiful posters from the 60s with those huge oversized sans serif letters and just looked great and looked great with an exclamation point. And it kind of um, underlined what we were trying to do was, was to continue Patsy's campaign. Uh, and that's been, you know, the impetus behind that film is to bring, bring her her issues and 
her, um, you know, real advocacy back to life through the film. Um, and I, hopefully that's been inspiring to people. I think so. Unfortunately, both of these terrific films, The Best Chef in the World and Mink, are available via the New York Times Op Docs on YouTube. So you can check them out there if you want to see more of Ben's great work. Thank you so much, Ben. It's a pleasure to speak with you again. Thank you, Abe. Always a pleasure.